The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spent 13 years in Mecca building individuals before he had the opportunity to build a society. And during this time, he was building the building blocks that will create a successful society. Now, in the 13 years in Mecca, it was not only the individuals, he was also building a jama'ah out of these people, but he did not have the chance to build a society, a model that, of what he, the values that he's talking about until he moved to Medina. And it's interesting because 13 years is the majority of the time of the da'wah. So building the infrastructure that will give fruit in Medina took most of the time, but it paid off and it paid off in spades. What the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did is to build a culture of excellence. He expected a lot from the Sahaba and the most from himself. And by setting the example of excellence in everything he did, it was easier for the Sahaba to follow that lead. So I'm going to get to a couple of examples from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but let me give you a couple of examples from the Sahaba to see what kind of individuals they were. When the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Medina, he used to get correspondence from different tribes. And while the Arabian Peninsula mostly spoke Arabic, but there were very important and significant pockets that spoke Hebrew. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Zayd ibn Thabit, young Sahabi, he told him, I receive correspondence in Hebrew and I have to answer to them and I am forced to rely on the Jews of Medina to translate for me. What that means is that they get to see state secrets. I want you to learn Hebrew. So Zayd ibn Thabit, he's the one telling us a story. So Zayd ibn Thabit said, I immersed myself in learning Hebrew for half a month. He said, for half a month, that's 15 days at best. And after that, I used to translate for the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I used to write back in Hebrew. Now that's really interesting. Now bear in mind that Hebrew is a language of the same language family as Arabic, but it's a very different language. If an Arab hears two people speaking Hebrew, they'll pick up words every now and then. It's like, you know, a Spanish person hearing somebody speaking Portuguese. But they're not going to understand. Now how can a person learn a language in 15 days? With dedication, that's how. With a culture of excellence, that's how. Now bear in mind, when did Zayd ibn Thabit learn to write to begin with? You know in the Battle of Badr, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ransomed some of the prisoners of war. Their ransom was to pay ransom and the others their ransom was to teach 10 Muslim youth to read and write. So he could not read and write, he was a little kid. He could not read and write until the Battle of Badr. But he was so studious, the next year, there he is learning a second language. The following year, the Messenger Sallallahu tells him, you know, I also received letter, letter in Syriac. Will you learn Syriac? So it must have been harder, it took him 18 days. You know? <laughs> and then he could write back in Syriac. That's the culture of excellence. The Messenger والسلام, built this into the Sahaba. He taught them, in Allah loves that if one of you does a job, that he does it well, that he perfects it. And perfection belongs only to Allah. But targeting perfection belongs to all of us. Shooting toward perfection belongs to all of us. And the culture of excellence becomes a habit. It's a habit you can adopt like any other habit. When you pick up the habit, you expect the most from yourself. And what does it mean for a Muslim to excel? It means to be driven, but also to be well-rounded. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum were geniuses that were smart, not because every one of them was just endowed with a natural talent that is superhuman, but because they adopted that culture of excellence. They were well-rounded people. They excelled spiritually, they excelled intellectually, and they excelled practically.
There is a charming story about Ali ibn Abi Talib. <coughs> I love it. When he was Khalifa. He was Khalifa and he was judge. Sorry, before he was Khalifa, he was judge. So when he was judge, <coughs> two men differed. They came to him and they said, we came together to eat eight loaves. Jazakallah khair. Allah barik fiqh. Jazakallah khair and kathir. Normally I don't like to drink when I'm talking because other people can't drink, but because my sore th uh, because I have a sore throat, I'll take a sip. Saqakallah khair minha fil jannah wa anka radin. Alhamdulillah. So they said, we came together to eat bread. I brought three loaves, my friend brought five loaves. And as we were about to eat, a third person came in and said, can I join you? He said, of course, come and join us. And all of us ate about equally. When that person came to leave, he left eight coins. So we differed. I figured I only brought three loaves. My friend brought five loaves. So I should take three, he should take five. But my friend said, no, he ate about equally. So we should split it equally, four and four. What do you think? Between those two, you know, what should we do? So Ali ibn Abi Talib gave a casual, well, between those two, I guess it would be acceptable for it to be divided three and five. So the man says, no, no, I want what the right thing is. So Ali said, the right thing is, you take one, your friend takes seven. He says, how come? So Ali ibn Abi Talib explained. He said, you brought combined eight loaves. You all ate about equally. So you ate eight thirds. Your friend ate eight thirds and the guest ate eight thirds. But you brought nine thirds, three loaves. Your friend brought 15 thirds, five loaves, right? And the third person ate equally. And therefore, he ate from your share one third. You see, from your share of nine eighths, you ate eight thirds, he ate one third. And he ate seven thirds from his friend. Now, the interesting thing is, you wouldn't think of it. The interesting thing is, Ali ibn Abi Talib was not showing off. Because he says, you know, well, if you're disputing three or five, by, you know, you can do three and five. He wasn't trying to show off. But somehow in his mind, he thought of it. Clever, it's smart, he broke it down. How much that person actually ate from each person's share and actually gave the right judgment. Because he did not take the issue of being a judge casually. He didn't say, well, to be a judge, I just have to make some nice effort, you know, and whatever seems right, I'm going to go in that direction. No, he understood that there is a science to it. It has to be done right. Whatever you do, you do right. Now it's interesting how the Messenger وسلم, expected the most from himself. One time the Sahaba عنهم, go out on a campaign. And as they're about to set up camp, the Sahaba عنهم, they divide the, the tasks. One person hunts the food, one person sets up the tents and everything. And then the Messenger وسلم, said, and I'm going to get the firewood, which is the dirtiest and the hardest and the least desirable task. But that was the way of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was always at the forefront. You know Ali, the same Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, he said during the battle of Hunayn, Muawiyah and I were pulling back the Messenger's horse because he was charging always at the front and we did not want him to outrun the army. He says when fighting got tough, we used to duck behind the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he was always in the forefront. That is the culture of excellence. That's what it means to have a culture of excellence. You look at the luminaries of Islamic history and you will find one thing in common. They expected a lot of themselves. They set a high standard, a high bar. They didn't say so and so is good enough. They shot, they aimed high. You know how Bukhari became Bukhari? He was a teenager in the masjid. And older people, this would be after the time of the Sahaba, two generations later, they're talking and they're saying there are so many hadith narrated by, uh, that are attributed to the Messenger وسلم, And so many of them are weak and made up. We can't distinguish them anymore. If only someone would set aside the hadith that are sahih, so we know what to follow. And he said, I'm going to be that. And he dedicated himself, himself to that. That is the culture of excellence. You know what the Messenger says about this? He says, one time he judged between two people. 
in a, some sort of business deal, and then he judged in favor of one against the other because he did not keep up his end of the business deal. And then, as the man is leaving, he says, "Hasbi Allah wa Nama Wakil." It's a beautiful thing. It's in the Quran, in the plural. It's in the Quran, the plural. He says, "Allah is sufficient for me, and He's the best one to be relied upon." But the messenger didn't like it because the man didn't do his job. So the messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, tells him, "Inna Allah yalumu ala al-ajz." Allah blames the helpless. Walakin alayka bil kais. But you have to engage in case. What is case? Good planning, husnut tadbiri wa tasarruf. Good planning and good execution. When you do business, plan it right and do it right. Then after that, فَإِذَا غَلَبَكَ أَمْرٌ فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ وَنَعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ Once you've done what you're supposed to do, then a matter overcomes you and you can't do it, then you say حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ وَنَعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ that is again reinforcing the same culture. We as a Muslim community, if we want to succeed, we have to understand that we are facing world-class challenges and we have to be world-class people in order to meet those world-class challenges. If we want our community to succeed, it will succeed when the building blocks of that community are solid and strong building blocks. Then we will have a solid and strong Muslim community. We must divorce the culture of mediocrity once and for all, we must embrace the culture of excellence. We must know that success is a choice. People choose to succeed by keeping on trying and they choose to fail by giving up. When they throw their hands up in the air or they stop trying. I've tried, I'm exhausted. I remember one time I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. And my friend is telling the third friend, he's saying, you know, I was talking to this person and I was trying to bring him to Islam, I was giving him da'wah and I spent like 45 minutes and I went nowhere, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. So my friend, the third friend tells him, he says, no, I spent 950 years and I've taken out from them, I've taken this up from that time. Don't give up so easily. You know Allah says in the Quran, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Order your family to pray. This is in the context of extra prayers, praying of the night. وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا It's not اصبر عَلَيْهَا, have patience. اصطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا That's what's known as sabr al-sineen. It is great patience. Long-term patience. Keep on trying and trying and trying. Don't think it's going no, in, uh, nowhere. It is. You are building something. One time after the next, after the next. Nuh alayhi salam had the same culture of not giving in. You so he says, um, uh, he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I've called my people. I've called my people by night and by day. It only increased them in, in running away. And every time I call them so that you would forgive them, not even asking anything from them, come and I'll ask Allah to forgive you. They put their fingers in their ears. They're mocking him. They're not just turning away. They're covering themselves with the clothes. They're putting him down. They're making fun of him. When they insist, and they became arrogant. Then I give up. No. Then I call them publicly. Then I call them as groups and I call them as individual. So he's not giving in. He's trying everything that is available to him because he expected the most from himself. Can you imagine what it means for one person to be asked to build a huge boat? And he do does it? Do you know the kind of quality individual who could build a large boat by himself? With very little help. He did have a little bit of help from a couple of people. But essentially he did the whole thing himself. That's what we need. We need to expect the most from ourselves. You know, we talk about, uh, when we talk about generosity, we think of Abu Bakr Siddiq who gave all of his wealth. You know how the messenger stacks up against Abu Bakr? What Abu Bakr became world famous for doing once, the messenger did every single time he got money. He would give all of it away, keeping food for the day. I can't tell you how many hadith there are where the Sahaba radiallahu would say we met the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he hasn't eaten for two days. Or the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to Misiya Fatima radiallahu anha and she has a little bit of food, a couple of days. So she gives him one. So he says this is the first food that enters your father's mouth in three days. That's how he was eating. And he had the potential. 
He had money coming in, but he would always give it away. Because 20% of the spoils of war of every single battle by Quran are his personal property to do as he willed. You know what he willed to do with it? To give it all away. In the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the kind of culture we need to adopt. We have, in the example of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, a great example. But it's not an example to entertain us. It's an example to lead us. It's an example to show us the way. Do you want to succeed? Because somebody did it before. Do you want to meet the difficult challenges of life? Somebody did it before. And they did it well. And they dealt with the same issues. You know, you're dealing with <coughs> waste of time on social media. They wasted their time in their club gatherings. You're talking about the spread of indecency. They had the houses with red flags. It was open and legal prostitution. You're talking about how people are dressing today. They used to make the offer on the Kaaba naked. You're talking about people cursing today. They used to be creative about the way they curse. You don't see it a lot in hadith because the Sahaba didn't like to record these things. They used to be creative about the way that they curse. They were immersed in a society whose values are different from their values. But they understood that their role is not to play along. Their role is to exercise leadership. To reshape society with better values. Instead of the strong taking advantage of the weak. Instead of the armed one shooting the unarmed poor black person who happens to be in his grandmother's house. There is respect for human life regardless of race. That's the value that they offered their society. They reshaped their society. And yes, they were a minority. And yes, they were oppressed. Much more oppressed than we ever were. Much more put down than they ever were. And Fox News back then was much more active than it is now. But the messenger used every means available to him. His message was relevant. And his people were an example. I want to close with this. Do you want to know the quality of the Sahaba? Here it is. One time the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hears about a tribe that is about to invade Medina. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was never taken by surprise. So he sent them a small group of Sahaba. Before they could attack, he, you know, at night when they were not prepared, he captured all of them. The whole army. Nobody was killed. Brought them, set up camp for them right next to the masjid. Right? They were confined to the camp. The messenger ordered that their, that their uh, shackles would be loose, that they would be treated well. That's it. Didn't do anything bad to them, did not punish them. He ordered that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum would not mistreat any one of them. But they, he set up camp for them right outside the masjid. So they observed for about three, four weeks, uh, for about, sorry, uh, two weeks. Muslims going in and out of the masjid. And the Mus Muslims would chat with them. And the Muslims would share with them their foods. And the Muslims would be nice to them. And they saw Aus and Khazraj, who had been killing each other for decades, intermarrying. Now, they saw Muslims praying in ranks. They saw how people of different races treated each other. At the end of the two weeks, the Messenger saw and let them go. That was the punishment. They were confined to a space for two weeks. At that moment, most of them embraced Islam. You know why? Because the Messenger وسلم, had the Sahaba who were an impressive model. All he needed is for those people to see Islam. The Messenger knew what we know. Most of Islamophobia is out of ignorance, not out of malice. But if our message is not out there, if our example is not out there, if people do not see the values of Islam in us, then we are contributing to the message of Islamophobia. But if people see in us the right model and example, then our example will speak louder than any Islamophobic message out there. I ask Allah to make out of us a cohesive, very diverse community that embodies the values of Islam, that embodies the is the value of excellence, expecting the most from ourselves, exercising moral leadership, intellectual leadership, and practical and social leadership, so that we will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having been true to his message. Jazakumullah khair, barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.